Tonight's guest is Chris Kennelly. I had a sighting of him on a field trip, I think, uh, with his distinctive field mark beak there. So I wanted to put that in. Uh, Chris is a principal software engineer at Google, and he lives with his partner at Croton on Hudson. And uh, I know he's had a bit of a journey with his bird photography over the last several years, so I asked if he'd be so kind to come share that and share his images tonight. So welcome, Chris. Uh, so just to get started, um, my partner and I ended up moving up to Westchester in February 2021 uh, because, in part, we got very tired of living in a one-bedroom New York City apartment for the pandemic. Uh, and so we began going on nature walks of just like, hey, let's get outside the house. Let's go see things. Uh, you know, at least there isn't COVID outside uh, among the trees and the forests. And I ended up deciding to buy a camera at that point. And we we went to Crown Point Park with a friend shortly after I got that camera. And I ended up getting these pictures of these northern flickers. Uh, so very uh, not telephoto lens, comparatively, um, and not very cropped, and terrible lighting. Like, everything was wrong about this picture, basically. Um, but it was one of the early ones I took, and was like, oh, that's interesting. And, you know, oh, look, on the internet, birds are much more colorful than when the sky is gray and overcast. Um, and it was also a different bird that I, that I had seen before compared to, like, okay, I have some robins in my backyard uh, and a cardinal. And if I look carefully and listen for the drumming, I'll find the red belly woodpecker. Um, obviously, seeing a lot more birds led to, okay, I can recognize a lot more species. Uh, but that was sort of the, the start of the journey. Um, and, you know, going and walking, and this was on uh, Riverside Avenue in Crown, coming back from Crown Landing Park, seeing a red-tailed hawk, and again, terrible photography days. Um, and again, also not very much reach and being terrible at cropping. Uh, I know I could go edit the photo back and zoom in and you know can't really do anything about the uh, insulator hanging off the telephone pole, uh, but say la vie. So I then, after this moment, ended up buying going to B&H's website and immediately going and saying, OK, I'm going to buy a much bigger lens. Uh, for comparison um, and saying like, okay, I can now zoom and enhance and start looking at like the birds that were coming to our feeders in the backyard or this house finch going crazy for dandelions. Um, I ended up showing this to a coworker who also does some, you know, amateur bird photography. And he's like, okay, is that finch dead or something? And I'm like, no, 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 it's just really loves dandelions. Um, and that kind of got the ball rolling of taking more and more pictures. And then, you know, that was kind of the extent of gear and equipment upgrades for a while, but then also just a lot better in terms of technique. Um, and so we went to Crown Point Park and got this picture of a white-breasted nuthatch very inquisitively on a tree over by the tent camping area. Um, and so this ended up being taken basically at the minimum focusing distance of my camera. Um, and really helped with the whole lesson of getting close, uh, which kind of became the overall theme of like, I think of all the pictures I'm going to go through today, a lot were taken basically as close as I could get, uh, if possible. Some were taken at distance just due to, you know, not trying to scare the bird, or the bird was over, you know, a chasm of water and there was nothing I could do about it. Um, and, Going to Central Park has been a fantastic opportunity for uh, this black crown night heron of being able to get very close and the birds in Central Park being pretty calm and chill about people uh, simply because if they didn't, they'd pull all their feathers out um, or fly away elsewhere uh, to not be near so many people. Uh, but the the birds around the pond and the ramble have been great for being able to just get reasonably close, get full frame pictures and um, end up being able to have reasonably high quality images with basically any camera. Uh, turns out I could probably do a lot with better technique, a lot better in Central Park than I probably could wandering around uh, the wilderness of Westchester. Uh, so for my next photo, uh, this was taken kind of in the peak of migration season last year. I went for, and I think it kind of 
is a bit of a shift from, you know, wandering around in, for a purposeful nature walk of, hey, I want to go outside to more, hey, I want to go look for birds to take pictures of specifically. Um, I ended up taking a day off in the middle of September, going wandering around Rockefeller for three or four hours and getting this picture of a northern perlua um, eyeing berries. And that was a different transition from, okay, I'm going to just go for a walk and happen to take pictures to, okay, I'm going to go look for the birds explicitly with the goal of getting a picture. And uh, while I said most pictures would be from the Northeast uh, or the local area, I uh, ended up getting this a great series of poses from this Anna's hummingbird in Santa Barbara County. Uh, we had gone on vacation out to Santa Barbara, ended up seeing it, uh, and it, it would perch, and the, the hummingbirds just didn't care. Uh, so they would perch on a, a shrub. You could be 10 feet away. They would just look at you. Maybe they would make humming noises, uh, but they would pose, get various light angles, and let you see all the colors of uh, their you know, feathers. There was also the kestrel, I was hanging out for the basically the duration of the winter at Crone Point Park. Um, it this is reasonably cropped, but ended up being able to get close-ish uh, for a kestrel before it would want to fly off or anything like that, um, and get pretty good pictures compared to you know, especially given poor technique, poor maybe maybe not poor equipment, but you know, less telephoto equipment than I maybe had in the past. And so returning over to Central Park, um, I got this in the spring migration of a brown thrasher at Central Park, um, where again, being able to take a picture from several feet away uh, because of the pathways and partly because the birds were pretty used to people wandering by, uh, worked out really well. There was somebody who said, hey, I'm gonna go look for the brown thrasher. And we found it uh, through a bunch of thicket of shrubs that didn't have any leaves on them yet. Um, and then we ended up rediscovering it or you know, a second one just as we were on our way almost out of the ramble and got this picture that was very clean shot, no branches obtruding, um, and also very close uh, to be able to get a good picture. So I, and then in May, I went on the sawmill walk up Doodletown Road. Uh, we heard lots of cerulean warblers. We didn't see any cerulean warblers to really speak of, uh, unfortunately. But you've got a you know, few other species that we had the hooded warbler, we had um, the cedar waxwing, and you know it was it and a few others were able to pose very nicely for us to be able to get good pictures um, as a result. And that was certainly a, a hike where I was hoping for a warbler so I could like have the picture and put it in eBird and say like, oh yeah, I've actually seen it, not just I totally heard the bird uh, and you know believe I saw the bird or described it, um, but it wasn't to be that morning. Uh, so for, and then I guess I should take a look, be sure the chat is not doing anything. Or is the chat stopped? Chat stopped. OK. Just wanted to be sure. Um, so the, for my next picture, I have an older flycatcher that was on the road up to the Nature Center at Crone Point Park. I had gone to Crone Point in the morning, um, wandered around the Nature Center, heard flycatchers, saw birds buzzing around. Um, this one helpfully posed on the uh, shrubs, kind of on the left side of it. Uh, right before the driveway kind of starts up the hill and was able to kind of take a long series of photos of just like trying to get approach it uh, and find a place where I could frame things where I didn't have to deal with uh, you know a tree right next to me uh, and ended up landing on this nice bare branch to be able to get uh, a good background and also just not having a weird like oh I'm, it's a great picture but there's a stick blocking its eye or something like that, um, that can sometimes be a problem. And so I think, of, like certainly, I think one thing I'll also emphasize of while I've picked a few photos for this talk, 
Um, I've taken many, 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 many more and uh, done a lot of calling of just, okay, I took a lot of pictures or I took pictures of the, everything that moved and then I hoped for the best of, you know, what else could I get of, you know, finding the best uh, ones that I liked a lot. And over the course of the summer, we ended up, again, going for a walk to Crone Landing Park. Um, the killdeer had chicks. Could get all sorts of things from the fences along the railroad tracks of you know, chicks being brooded um, by a parent for them studying, in the case of this one, studying its reflection in the water kind of along the gravel embankment. Um, and this is again with like my lens pushed all the way up against to the fence to avoid having too much chain link um, distortion in it. Um, but it was otherwise able to, it was just, you know, it and a few others were staring kind of at their reflections or looking at the water, hopefully maybe find some food um, while we were along our, going along the walk for Crown Landing Park. And I think the other kind of piece of technique I've picked up uh, is to take pictures of anything that moves. Um, I had gone to the railroad station and I had gone for a walk down to the end where the canoe launch is. And I saw a bald eagle in the distance, so I scurried to the next opening by one of the benches. And then I started taking pictures. I didn't have the best uh, shutter speed. I didn't have the best uh, exposure set. But I took this picture, and then I realized when I was looking at my camera that there was a red-winged blackbird basically on the back of this bald eagle. Um, and I then later saw the you know red wing fly off back into the Pragmites and go on its way, and the bald eagle flew off, you know, being discouraged to ever go into the Crown River ever again. Um, <laughs> so like and then you know had to go play with the exposure to kind of bring up brain it a little bit, but it certainly is like okay, I I'm glad I had enough shutter speed. I'm glad I had enough exposure to be able to have a usable image of a red wing mobbing a bird many orders of magnitude bigger than it um, that could probably make a nice meal out of it if it so chose um, but I think it was just very you know confused about what was going on uh, and then the summer we had um, the red-tailed hawk nest at Crone Point Park uh, with two young this is now when they're you know past their fuzzy Muppet stage of you know, being in the nest to now having fledged and moving about with their parents, um, that they helpfully landed at the and perched at the transformer near the park office. Um, there's another uh, that was would have been in the frame if I had zoomed out a bit, um, but they both perched there very nicely while we were exiting the park, and so it was like, okay, I'll park, grab my camera back out of my trunk, take the picture, and then you know, go on home. Um, and so speaking of birds uh, being unhappy with much larger birds, uh, I was at marshlands and there had gone out to the salt marsh and found a very angry willet chasing an osprey who was very confused about what was going on. Uh, the osprey, I have several other frames of the same osprey being chased uh, in various poses and then eventually disappeared and the willet went back to uh, the salt marsh, um, but again, I think being able to get airing on the side of being able to have a high shutter speed to be able to just capture whatever might happen, uh, I'm glad I had done so, and I came across, you know, an interesting photo that I probably otherwise would not have expected of just, you know, okay, there's a willet making willet noises off in the salt marsh, and an osprey flew over, um, but I got lucky of just, you know, happening to point my camera in the right direction at the right time. Um, and so then, again, kind of in the theme of, you know, more purposeful look, go and look at birds for the pic purpose of hoping to get some good pictures. Um, my partner had a conference in Massachusetts, and so I went onwards to Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. And at the south edge is Sandy Point State Preserve, uh, run by the state of Massachusetts. And they leave the beaches open during the summer. Um, they rope off parts but 
they have a small parking lot um, and there's a number of people mostly just like fishing at six in the morning or sunrise or whenever it might be. Um, but I could lay in the sand right by the tide line and end up with a lot of zoom and a lot of cropping get pictures of piping plover chicks wandering around feeding, the adults wandering around feeding, um, just walking by basically um, and then get also you know, a decent pictures for no, no real obstructions because it was a beach and the background was re really far away um, as a result. But again, very much in the theme of like uh, trying to be close, but not too close, having a lot of telephoto uh, zoom as a result um, and finding good backgrounds of, hey, it's just sand. So there's no real like distractions in it or you know, it might be a piece of driftwood somewhere in the back, but it's hard to tell. Uh, and the other big trip I did over the course of the summer was going to Long Island for several days and spending a lot of quality time at Nickerson Beach um, because with enough time, you could get a lot of different you know, moments of action um, in di several different bird species. Uh, you had the terns with much bigger chicks at this point bringing in food, the chicks doing various actions, chicks begging at any adult that might happen to be flying by uh, with a fish, um, and then them bringing it in, feeding it to their chick, and then taking off again to, you know, repeat the process, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes later. Uh, and so this was taken just by sitting, you know, near the colony ropes with the camera for you know, two hours after sunrise and just waiting. And then if an adult showed up, try to grab a few pictures, hope it wasn't too blurry, um, go back uh, and then wait and holding the lens and, and camera until you know eventually another adult showed up uh, with another th fish to feed them. Uh, and the Nickerson has a couple different, I'd say, you know, attractive, interesting species to end up looking at. Uh, you have the American oyster catcher, uh, it had, its chicks had nested and hatched a little bit earlier. Um, and so there were a few families that would, the adult would be going on to, wading into the water uh, where the waves were coming in, grab some food, bring it up to the waiting chicks who would come and approach it from the other direction, hand it off, and then you know repeat this process over and over again. Uh, and this was just from walking along the beach and realizing this interaction was about to happen in front of me and being like, okay, I'm gonna drop to the ground uh, take, be able to get the pictures I was hoping for. Um, and they went off and then, you know, I was able to continue my walk along the beach anyways. Uh, and then the other uh, species I'll offer for Nickerson Beach is the black skimmer, uh, which had a fairly large successful colony this year. Uh, you have them just doing skimming. Um, very unusual or strange looking bird if you haven't seen it. Of they have a lower mandible that is much, much bigger than the other, uh, which skims nicely in the water like this one is doing. Um, there's a dog pond, a dog park at the beach um, as to give dogs something to do when they come to the beach because they're otherwise banned on the beach. And there's a small pool that the skimmers and also turns would come over to to go drink water from, uh, but it ends up setting up very nice lines for they'll be flying directly south or directly north at you. Um, and you can end up getting pretty good photos of them skimming on reasonably calm water, whereas the ocean might just be too windy that day uh, to get good pictures or the tide's not in the right place. Uh, and the, the other feature of having a large skimmer colony would be the chicks at their various nests. And so you'd have the skimmers, I think, were a little bit less active because there were just fewer chicks at the time when I was there in July, uh, but there were a few nests with chicks, and so adults would come fly in. Uh, I tried one day, you know, sitting at sunset watching a nest that I I saw a chick at or two chicks at, and the adult had flown off, and you never saw them before sunset. Uh, so it was certainly very much a patience game for me of just finding, hopefully, moments of action, whereas the turns seemed to always just be one after another, getting a fish, also coming with fish much more often, 
the skimmer is less so, uh, but it's still made for pretty good photography uh, of different moments of, you know, bringing a fish, trying to offer it, the chick sometimes not taking it right away, which surprised me a bit um, at Nickerson Beach. Uh, and these, uh, the next few were taken at Jamaica Bay uh, Wildlife Refuge. Um, and I think, again, much more into the spirit of dedicated for the purpose of looking at birds uh, sort of trips rather than I'm going to go for a walk and happen to take pictures of birds. Um, and that these were taken in the muck of the East Pond, uh, wearing rubber boots and waders just because I want to be able to sit in the mud, um, which, and I'm glad I had those because I did get muddy and I did have my boots try to sink into the muck uh, at a few points. And so this is an American avocat that was hanging out with a few gulls. Um, and then it would end up using its upturned beak and sweeping the water, looking for food, um, then went kind of behind the gulls and then, you know, stopped being quite as photogenic to go sleep. Um, but able to get reasonably close um, with reasonably tame-ish birds that weren't uh, trying to you know, run away, like if I were trying to do this um, somewhere, like at Rockefeller, I can't just go walk into the trees or something. Uh, that's probably how I'd actually just get ticks. And the other draw of birds there uh, at the time was the Hudson Godwits. There was a pair, and they were also um, feeding, and they were kind of following each other along. Um, and again, being able to get reasonably close and also have, you know, almost no background to speak of because the, the the reed line was maybe 100, 200 feet across from the other side of the East Pond made it for having very clean photos that I was able to get um, as a result. And the other, the third, I guess, draw, big draw of the, you know, two days I spent at Jamaica Bay was a juvenile Wilson's uh, farlope uh, that happened to just be, you know, going around in circles, looking for food, um, and kind of being hard to find at various points. Uh, I ended up hiking from one end of the East Pond to the other, managed to find it, and then like the next morning I came out hoping to find it, and it was of course on the other side of the pond, and so I have a much uh, smaller photo of it that's all of, you know, 100 pixels across um but it's like okay i'm pretty sure i can tell that's the bird and it isn't just a different gull or something um because this one again being able to be reasonably close uh with a very distant background mix for or, uh, and low to the ground makes for excellent photography um obviously um there are other birds at uh, jimmy Bay wildlife refuge including this belted kingfisher in flight. Um, the day was still quite hot when I was there, and so I had gotten a few other photos uh, before trying to put on rubber uh, boots and waders and being very hot in 80 degree weather. And so I was standing in dry ground where I could you know, just take, take in the, the sights. Um, and so there was a kingfisher that kept flying back and forth between kind of where I was standing in one of the trees on the west side of the pond and the ruins and eventually it got close enough and I got enough pictures where I could actually have one that I could crop in a little bit um, but otherwise have it be pretty sharp and have a lot of detail about the, the bird. And uh, to close things out this was a black thread blue that I got in Central Park uh, about two weeks ago, um, maybe a week ago, um, and I think again having the benefit of being able to have warblers, you know, moving along the tree or the shrubs feet from you has been very good for being able to get good photos. Um, I think certainly I think technique has been a large part of my photography journey of just being able to know how to where to go that I can find approachable birds or to know where to go that I can you know, improve my technique so I don't scare them off prematurely, um, especially in the case of very small flighty songbirds where uh, I, I just have to take a lot of pictures, I have to get reasonably close, 
Uh, and that because they're so small, I, w I want to be able to zoom in as much as possible and you know, try to have as a big of an image rather than yeah, I crop this very small thing and I don't really see much of the detail about the bird. And so I will stop there and I'm happy to turn things over to any questions people might have.